No, it's not on. Yes. Okay, that's perfect. Oh, that's good. All right. All right, everybody, we're going to get going. Welcome, welcome to Rock Talk. Exactly. <laughs> so just so all of you in the room here on the island realize we are also um, doing a webinar so people off island can enjoy this talk as well. And keep that in mind. When you leave here, you can still be here in a way on these webinars. So all of this is on our website. So you can sign up and join us when you're not here. So for those of you who I have not had the pleasure of meeting yet, I'm Dr. Jennifer Seavey, the executive director of this year lab. And um, for those of you online, and maybe some of you don't realize this, that Shoals Marine Laboratory is the largest and the oldest undergraduate focused marine lab in the country. Probably, yeah, right? And we are a joint institution of Cornell and UNH. But everybody is welcome here. And we are glad that you are here. And every summer we have this marine science seminar series that we belovedly call Rock Talks because they used to actually happen out on the rocks, but you know, technology and such. Um, so. Um, happy to have you here. So our format tonight is for about 45 minutes talking from Leslie and then Q&A from all of you here in the room. I will come to you with this here mic so that people online and on our recording can hear it. By the way, I should also stop here and say that all of our rock talks from the past few years are also online, which if you're doing a research project here, you might want to look at that real quick make sure there's none on the topic that you're interested in. Um, so I will pass this around for questions. And if you want to ask a question online, please use the Q&A box and I will read that out loud to our speaker and to the room so everyone can have that question. Um, and if you have any problems online, please use the, the chat and Casey will help you out there. And that's the logistical stuff. And now I am super excited to welcome Dr. Leslie Babonis with us from Cornell. <laughs> Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. <laughs> I love the love in here right now. For her lab. So I'll just sum it up by the way I heard you talk to Warren and, and, and Mike tonight. Her lab looks at how novel traits and organisms come and go evolutionarily. And she's really um, focused a lot on stinging cells. And she told some really crazy cool stories about how stinging cells come and go in different things like corals and jellyfish, things like that. So um, really neat uh, research you're going to be hearing about tonight. We're so excited that you are here. She has an undergraduate degree from the University of Miami. And she has a PhD from the University of Florida. Can I get all the gators in the room? <laughs> all right, so that was just me and Dave and Leslie. Re Rebecca Atkins it, it also is a gator, but she's not on the island right now, one of our serfs. Anyway, fun fact, she was once the mayor of Marineland, Florida. That's kind of cool. And she also spent a, a mayor, right? So you can ask her about that. And uh, she also spent a large part of her childhood in Hawaii. And she said she likes to bounce back and forth between Hawaii and Florida. So now you can also ask her how, what she thinks about Ithaca. So <laughs> without further ado. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, thank you for that lovely introduction, Jen. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, as I will talk about kind of at the end of the talk, uh, Marine Labs have been a really informative, a really formative part of my experience and my growing up into being a scientist. 
And so it's a pleasure and a privilege to get to present to all of you here at this Marine Lab. Um, and so I thought what I would do today is kind of talk really broadly about my field and how I think about science, talk a little bit about uh, the science that we actually do in my lab, and I'll give you just a little kind of tidbit of data. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to back out a little bit and talk about my journey and how I got to where I am here today. And so you should feel free to interrupt me as we go if you have questions or we can take them at the end, whichever is preferable to you. Okay, so here we go, hopefully, maybe not. <laughs> this is not an auspicious start. There we go. Okay, so uh, I'm an evolutionary developmental biologist. Can I hide these? Hide. Great. Um, and so my field is broadly called EvoDevo. How many of you have heard of EvoDevo before? Okay, many of you have not, which is great. You're gonna learn something today. So we're already off on the right foot. And so evolutionary developmental biology, as its name suggests, is really kind of charged. We're, we're interested in understanding evolution from the perspective of understanding how embryos development. And so for me, <laughs> I shouldn't have paused. All right, here we go, here we go. There we go. For me, it all starts here. It all starts with this truly staggering and impressive array of diverse body plans that we see among animals that live on the planet today. This is where it all, this is where I derive my inspiration for when I'm doing science, is trying to understand how all of these animals evolved to look so different and to have such different functions. And so this animal here, who knows what this animal is in the corner? You can't see it. Yes, it's a tinafor. I don't think I can point to the screen. Okay, we're gonna skip that. Um, that's a tinafor, that's right. So how did that animal evolve to look like this kind of uh, gelatinous little blob? Whereas the organism next to it, this one, uh, has the privilege of having these kind of long wispy tentacles. Anyone know what that animal is? You do, you don't get to answer. Anybody else know? That's a sea anemone. It happens to be the one we work on most uh, often in my lab. Uh, so those animals are actually not very closely related to each other, even though they're both kind of squishy, soft-bodied marine invertebrates. How did those animals become so different from the animal next to them? This one is a scallop, right? This animal evolved the ability to secrete a calcium carbonate shell. So they have their little soft body tucked inside two really hard shells that protect them from the environment. And then what's up with this? Look at this slide. How many worms do you see up here? Why is the worm strategy so successful? Why have so many animals evolved to look like worms? These are the questions that keep me awake at night, worms, right? Yeah. Um, this one, anyone know what this animal is down here? It's a sponge, yes. It actually happens to be a delicious sponge. So this one secretes a skeleton made out of glass, right? An animal makes glass. It has a skeleton made out of glass, wild, right? And so I could go on forever. These are just the animals on the bottom row here, right? But how did these animals all become so different from each other? These are the questions that really drive my research is how do these animals become different? And then what are the limits to evolution, right? Some of you who are astute have noticed I snuck in a little secret animal here, right? Um, this is of course a unicorn, which is a fictitious animal. But is it really that unusual to think that animal could evolve, that, that morphology could evolve? It's, it seems pretty likely to me, right? What about that sponge? Do you think the sponge could evolve to have eyes, for example, or this critter right here? Who knows what that is? Tardigrade, everybody knows the tardigrade, of course. Could tardigrades evolve to have wings? I don't know, what limits evolution? Those are the questions that really kind of drive my research. I wanna know what, what can't evolve, what can evolve, what can't evolve. And so the way we ask that question, those types of questions, is by studying this. This is the most magical thing that happens in all of biology. This is embryonic development. And so what you're seeing here is actually development, early development in this animal, sea urchin. You're seeing one single egg, uh, cell, a fertilized egg, that's then going on to divide in half. Each of those daughter cells go on to divide in half. Each of those cells go on to divide in half. And this could get really boring if I keep describing what happens, right? This goes on and on and on and on until this animal forms, this embryo forms an adult. At some point during this process, some of these cells are gonna stop dividing and they're gonna specialize for a really specific function. Okay, and so in sea urchins, some of those functions might be things like secreting the calcium carbonate that they use to make their little mouth parts. So what you're looking at is the underside of a sea urchin now. And so you're looking at its little rasping mouth parts that are reaching out and grabbing bits of algae and kind of scraping them off of probably an aquarium in this video. And so some of the cells that arose from that embryo become the teeth. 
Some of them become the muscles that allow the teeth to kind of move in and out as they're scraping this algae off of the environment. Some of those cells go on to become the gut, right? The cells that are gonna secrete enzymes that break down the algae. Some of those cells are gonna go on to make the tube feet, which are the little uh, soft kind of squishy structures you see here. Some of them are gonna go on to make the spines. Uh, and these tissues are all heterogeneous, right? So the tube feet are actually sticky and kind of adhesive, but they're also sensory. And in some species of sea urchins, they have light detecting cells at the end of their tube feet. So they can see with the tips of their feet. And so this is the process that I'm really interested in is how do all these different cell types arise and how do these uh, then give rise to all of the different functions that different animals have? And so uh, this is like kind of how I organize my view about the world. Animals have lots of different cell types. And so by looking at the different cell types that different animals have, we can kind of organize animals into closely related groups um, and then try to understand how the different traits that make them unique evolve. All right, so let's start again with our model, the sea urchin that we've been looking at today. And let's see how this works by comparing this animal to two other animals. So who knows what these animals are? How about the one in the middle? It's a, who said it? Sea cucumber, yeah, uh-huh. And then the one on the right? Yes, that's a sea anemone, right. Okay, and so what we saw in the last slide is that sea urchins, for example, have lots of different cell types. But some of the ones that we talked about are the cells that make up the tube feet, and the cells that make up the spines in this animal, right? So they have both of these cell types. The sea cucumber also has cells that make up the tube feet. If you look really closely, you can actually see the tube feet running along these little ridges here, the kind of orange structures here, but they don't have spines. So this animal has spicules in their skin, but they don't really have the proper spines. And then how about the sea anemone? Do they have tube feet or spines? Correct, they have neither of those. And so by looking at this kind of distribution of traits at this really kind of broad level, you can start to think about how animals are related to each other. And what you might think is that these two animals on the left might be more closely related to each other because they share some level of traits, whereas the sea anemone is quite different from them because they don't share many traits. And so you would be right if you thought that these two animals on the left, the urchin and the sea cucumber are of course both echinoderms. And then on the right, anyone know uh, what a sea anemone is? What group it is? Nidarians, all right, you guys just learned this. This is way too easy for you, you all pass. Flying colors, right. <laughs> okay, and so the way we would describe how animals are related to each other in this very basic sense is by drawing a cladogram or a simple evolutionary tree to join these animals, right? And so any of the animals at the tips of the tree that are close together are more closely related to each other than animals that are found on branches that are farther apart, right? So these two animals connect, they have these two branches and they connect right here in the middle. And so what we say is that this uh, node in the middle is where the common ancestor of these two animals existed. So there were some animals that looked somewhere between a sea cucumber and a sea urchin. It gave rise to these two lineages that differentiated into these two groups of animals. Okay, so the ancestor of echinoderms is somewhere around here. The ancestor of uh, all animals, the animal group that unites cnidarians and echinoderms is thus lower on the tree way back here. And so implicit in these tree diagrams is the element of time. And so we know that ancestors that exist lower on the tree or older or existed longer ago than ancestors higher up in the tree. Does that make sense? Hopefully, nobody responded, but I'll just assume yes. <laughs> okay, and so why is this useful? It's useful because it enables us to make guesses about where these various different traits evolved, where they arose. And so that's where we go to look for the genes and the, and the um, proteins that control the development of these traits. And so for example, both sea urchins and sea cucumbers have tube feet. Right? And so we might imagine that the ancestor of all echinoderms also had tube feet and that these two lineages of animals have tube feet because they inherited that trait from their common ancestor. By contrast, we might think that spines arose here after these two lineages diverged so that sea urchins got spines, but sea cucumbers didn't. Okay, sea anemones, cnidarians in general, have the coolest cell type that you'll ever meet in your whole life, which I'll talk a little bit about today which are called stinging cells, right? They're found only in this group of animals. They're found in all cnidarians, only in cnidarians. And so we think that they likely did not evolve back here in the common ancestor of all animals, but rather they emerged somewhere along this branch leading just to cnidarians. Okay, and so this is how we can kind of organize 
relationships among animals and examine the evolution of their traits by kind of piecing these things together through time. Okay, so with this model in mind, I'm spending a lot of time on this because I'm going to show you a lot of trees that look like this through the rest of the talk. Uh, I want to pose to you the question that really drives a lot of my research, which is this one, which is how does new, how do new cell types arise? How do animals ever evolve the ability to have cell types that no other animals have, to have functions that no other animals have? <clears throat> and so to ask that question, I study the best animals in the whole world. Um, of course, these are the cnidarians. So this is a group of animals I probably don't need to introduce anyone to in here. Um, this is a group of animals that includes everything from the true jellies, like you see in the top right, uh, the box jellies that you see here next to them, things like immortal jellies, which are actually hydroids, um, other hydroids, stocked jellies, which I'm told are here, although there's some question about whether anyone's seen them or not. Uh, and then all of the things like sea anemones, tube dwelling anemones, hard corals and soft corals. The thing that makes these animals really special and really famous, of course, is their ability to sting. And that uh, is <laughs> illustrated here. This, I hope this isn't triggering for anyone. If you've ever interacted with a cnidarian, it probably resulted in an experience that you didn't care for. Um, and that's, of course, because they have these cells called stinging cells or cnidocytes. And so it lurking in the tentacles of these animals are these little cells you can see here on the left, you can see an unfired cell. So it's sitting here, it looks like a little pea kind of, um, sitting in the epithelium of the tentacle. And you can kind of see inside that, this little triangular shape, that's the harpoon. That's the stabbing structure that's waiting to come out and pierce you and deliver venom. On the right, you can see one of these stinging cells that has been captured midway through firing. And so you can see what happens if you look closely, this harpoon that you can see here, this triangle structure, rockets out of the apex of the cell. Look here, you can actually see the, the cell membrane is being ripped open by this thing. This thing fires outside of the cell, it kills the cell, and it takes with it these um, kind of urticating spines, really uncomfortable spines, and then attached to this harpoon structure is this long hollow tubule that goes kind of off the screen here that's full of venom. And in some species, that venom is quite toxic and actually can cause paralysis and death in humans. And so these cell types have been uh, really engaging, perplexing to scientists, you know, since the beginning of time, basically. Um, okay, and so before we want to go on, I want to ask, how many of you have heard the term nidocyte before? Oh, someone's doing a good job here. <laughs> how about the term nematocyte? Mm -hmm. Largely overlapping population. Okay. So nidocytes, nematocyte is a, a term that's much more common than the term nidocyte, but in fact, it's just one of three different types of what we call stinging cells or nidocytes. Um, they're the most famous, they're the piercing cells, and so they tend to look like this. They have this kind of stabby harpoon structure that comes rocketing out of them. Um, but I bring this up, there's two other types of quote unquote stinging cells, spirocytes and tichocytes. Um, which are names you don't really need to remember, except I'm going to talk about them a little bit later in the talk uh, because they're really cool and really unusual. Okay, so this is what I just described to you in words, but you can actually see it in a video. This is one single stinging cell that's being fired. And so if you can see that little white dot that has a, a little circle around it, that's actually the target for an infrared laser ablation system. And so we have this tiny laser that we mount on a microscope in my lab. Um, this system was originally designed for in vitro fertilization. So you can fire this laser at an egg cell and make it easier for the sperm to get in. We took advantage of that technology and it turns out if you fire it at a night, say you can make it fire really easily, um, which is great because then that means that we can characterize the firing mechanics. We can force these cells to fire and die. We can force them to regenerate. And then we can ask about what genes control the process of regeneration of this cell type. <clears throat> so if I pause the video here, I, may, I can show you the three main components of this cell type. So at the bottom left, you can see the capsule. Um, that's the structure that actually encloses all of the rest of the structures, which you can see extending away. So the harpoon is kind of that basal spiny region of the projectile apparatus. And then the tubule is that hollow part that is filled with venom coming away from it. And if you're a shrimp, um, it looks like this coming at you. So here you can see this is the, the arrow is pointing to the harpoon. So this kind of basal spiny region of it. And you can see the empty capsule is kind of tagging along down here. And the venom filled tubule is unfurling inside the shrimp exoskeleton. And that's how the venom is actually delivered. 
Now you might notice that this cell that I'm showing you in this video looks quite different from the one that I showed you on the last slide. So the one in this video is kind of rod shaped and elongate and the one on the last slide is sort of round and P-shaped. Well, it turns out if you look across cnidarians, stinging cells are not just one cell type. They're an incredibly diverse, really large group of cells that vary quite a lot, both in their morphology and their function. And so some of that diversity is represented here. So you can see in this top left image, some of these stinging cells are kind of small and lemon shaped. Some of them are really elongate and kind of rod shaped. They vary quite a lot in uh, the shape of the harpoon that comes out. So I don't know if you can see this one very well. This one has sort of a weird, uh, I don't know, bludgeoning device looking shape to it. Um, some of them have spines all along their tubule. They vary quite a lot in how they pack their tubule inside the capsule. So this one's kind of haphazard and all over the place. This one is super neatly, tightly coiled inside the capsule. Um, and they vary a lot in their apical structure. So this one is kind of not very interesting looking. This one has this really rigid cap structure, operculum structure that kind of pops open like a gate to allow the harpoon to come out. And so why do they, why is there so much diversity in this cell type? Well, there's so much diversity because uh, stinging cells are specialized for a lot of different functions. Um, their primary job is not actually to sting you, uh, but largely they're used in prey capture. Um, yes, uh, but they're also used in defense. Um, and the animals use these for anchoring into their environment. So on the left, you can see a lion's mane jelly that has captured a fish, a really rapidly moving vertebrate. Um, and so you can imagine that the stinging cells that you need to immobilize a vertebrate are, are quite toxic probably and have the ability to pierce through those kind of collagenous scales that are on the outside of the uh, fish. Um, on the top right, you can see two sea anemones that have decided that they're going to wage war on each other. And they fill up these little structures called acarygy, these little finger-like projections. And they reach out and they poke each other and they will sting each other to death, their own species. So they are vulnerable to their own toxin. And then on the bottom right, you can see a hydra that is attached to a little piece of seagrass and it's decided it doesn't wanna be there anymore. And so it bends over, this is actually a weird two-headed hydra. Um, it bends over, it attaches its tentacles to the grass and then it'll flip its foot over its head and it kind of somersaults away and that's how they move. And so because all cnidarians are doing these functions, they're defending themselves, they're trying to stay put in their environment and they're trying to capture food, each individual has multiple types of stinging cells. And so I like to illustrate that with this animal. Anyone know what this is? It's a little tricky. It's not a sea anemone. There's a structure that's out of view here. Yeah, it is a coral polyp, good job. This is actually a local species of coral. I'm not sure if they're right here on this island, but they're in cold waters here. It's called Estrangia poculata, the Northern star coral. It's the official state coral of Rhode Island. Um, they also live in my lab pretty happily. <laughs> but if you look inside different tissues in this animal, you find different stinging cell types. So for example, if you look in the mouth, which is right in here in the middle of all the tentacles, you find these two types of stinging cells. If you look in the body wall, you find this other type in the bottom left and so on. They have different types on the length of the tentacle and the tip of the tentacle because they're using these tissues for lots of different functions. Here's the cool thing too. Every single species of cnidarian, everyone has stinging cells. Some species have lots of different types of stinging cells. These things over here, way on the other side of the street, endonidazoans, it's a strange lineage of cnidarians. They're entirely parasitic. We didn't even know they were cnidarians until about 10 years ago when people found the proteins that make stinging cells in their genome. That's how we knew they were cnidarians. These are parasites that live in the soft tissue of fish, in the muscle of fish. Um, they have, as far as we can tell, only one type of stinging cell. All of the other cnidarians on here have multiple types of stinging cells. And so what that means to us is probably that stinging cells emerged. I don't know where to put this. <laughs> I guess that's probably it. here. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and so what we think that means is that stinging cells probably arose here in the common ancestor of all cnidarians. All cnidarians have them because they were present in the ancestor and they were inherited by all of the animals that differentiate that that diverged from that common ancestor. And so what that means is that we can use this same framework that we use for understanding how species became different from each other to understand how stinging cells 
became different from each other. And so what we can do is identify traits that make these cell types similar to each other and different from each other. So for example, you know, what makes this type of stinging cell different from this one? And what unites these three types of stinging cells to the exclusion of the other ones? And using this framework of understanding which ones are more closely related and how they became uh, different from each other, we can ask some really interesting questions. One of those is this one. How did stinging cell diversity arise? How did all of these cells become different from each other? How did they all specialize for such different functions? And then what did the first stinging cell look like? Did it even sting? Did it have a harpoon? Did it have venom? Uh, we don't really know. We don't know what the first one looked like or what its function was, but I think slowly and painfully we can get there hopefully before uh, I die. I'm not sure. Maybe, <laughs> I think. Probably, or maybe someone else will pick this up and work on it. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about kind of the first one of these questions today. I'm going to tell you just a very short story about one element of stinging cell diversity that we're studying in my lab um, using CRISPR technology in a sea anemone. Okay, so we work primarily on this animal. This is a burrowing species of sea anemone called Nematostella vectensis. It's the starlet sea anemone. Um, and so if you see them in pictures or if you see them in the lab, uh, they look like this. If you see them in the wild, um, they look like this. So they live kind of buried down into the sediment with just their mouth and whorl of tentacles exposed. Um, and you can see they kind of interact with their environment like this. They don't really build a tube, but sometimes they have uh, sand and sediment that's kind of stuck to their body when they're buried down there. Fortunately for us, um, they're also pretty easy to keep in Ithaca in bowls of artificial seawater. And so they're really easy um, as a marine lab model, even when you live nowhere near the ocean. <laughs> One of the things uh, that has made this animal such a valuable model for understanding evolution and development is that they are truly prolific spawners. And so a lot of sea anemones don't actually spawn. They don't actually reproduce sexually, or at least not very often. They reproduce uh, largely asexually by fission, by, by just ripping themselves in half, basically. This animal makes huge egg packets. So here you can see in this little video on the left, uh, three or four females that are releasing these packets of eggs that have, they can have anywhere from 100 to over 1,000 eggs released per female. And then on the right, you can see we can keep males and females separate. So we have males in one bowl and females in another. We can induce them to spawn just using a light cue. So we give them eight hours of light and they give us lots of gametes after that, about two hours after that. And so if we keep males and females separate, we can perform in vitro fertilization and we can capture even the very earliest moments of development in this animal. And so we can track individual cells that are dividing from the fertilized egg and figure out where they go and what they become. And so this is what that process looks like. So this is uh, embryonic development in nematostella. These are still images, not a nice video like the urchin video that I showed at the beginning, but uh, hopefully you can still get the point here. And so what's happening here is in panel A, you can see this little arrow is pointing to the site of sperm entry, the site of fertilization. That site of fertilization is gonna go on to become the site of first cleavage. And so this is where the first two cells, the cell membrane starts to pinch in and divide the first two cells in this animal. <clears throat> they actually skip the two cell stage, which is pretty unusual, and they go directly to the four cell stage. And then they go through this really bizarre pattern of cell cleavage or cell division that's unique to cnidarians. And it's called chaotic cleavage, which is a fun factoid for you. What it means is that each cell is dividing on its own pace, at its own rate. And so what they look like, if you look at them under the microscope, is little popcorns, because some cells are much bigger because they haven't divided yet, some are much smaller because they just went through division. The nice thing about that is if you pull uh, seawater out of the ocean and you look at larvae and embryos that are there, you can tell you're looking at a cnidarian because of chaotic cleavage. It's a really conserved trait. Okay, so 12 hours after fertilization or so, these animals reach what's called the blastula stage. So this is the stage when the animal is a hollow ball of cells. So they just have a thin layer of epithelium, one cell layer thick, surrounding an open space. And then the next thing that happens is arguably the most important thing that happens in the life of any of us. This happens in you too. This is called gastrulation. So that's happening here. What happens during gastrulation is cells on one side of this hollow ball start to change shape. They climb inside the other cells and they're gonna form a second layer of cells inside the outer cells. 
And what that does, it makes this animal have two cell layers, ectoderm on the outside and endoderm on the inside. And that gives them two different populations of cells from which to derive different cell functions. So the endoderm is gonna give rise to their gut uh, and the ectoderm is gonna give rise to a bunch of boring cells and then stinging cells. So the important stuff. Um, okay, they then go through these larval stages. They form this little sensory organ at the other end of uh, opposite their mouth. And then they start to form these little tentacle buds around the mouth and they eventually metamorphose into a polyp. They don't need a cue to metamorphose, they just do it, which is great for us. So I wanna draw your attention into these kind of later stages in development from the blastula to the tentacle bud stage, because this is where all the exciting stuff is, is happening, if you're me. All right, so here we are in these stages. So I just showed you these images. These are actually uh, images of what were once live animals. They were imaged live. And now I'm gonna show you a bunch of images that look like this. And so these are fluorescent images of embryos that were labeled with specific dyes and specific chemicals that show us where different cells are developing in the embryo. And so the first thing you can see there is um, blue. Hopefully you can see little blue dots everywhere. That's a dye that labels nuclei. It happens to be called DAPI. Um, and so that's gonna show you where all the cells are in the developing embryo. And it just gives you kind of an overview sense of what the animal looks like. The other dyes that you see here are gonna be marking specifically the proteins that make up stinging cells. And so I showed you these images in the beginning. There were three really large uh, primary components of this cell, the capsule, right? The capsule wall, and then the harpoon and the tubule that extends away from it. All of those structures are made of a really weird protein that's found only in cnidarians and only in stinging cells, all of these structures. And it happens to be called mini collagen. Uh, its name is derived from the fact that it has a short region that seems, looks like collagen, but it's a totally independent, really, independently derived protein found only in this cell type. And so if we track mini collagen, we can know where stinging cells are developing because it's only found in that cell type. All right, so using this dye, using this marker, we can show that stinging cells start to develop super early in development at or before the time of gastrulation, at or before when this animal is making its digestive tissues. And so I'm gonna zoom in on one of these stages right here um, and show you what you're looking at. So here, we've done two different techniques. Um, one where we can label RNAs. So this is telling us where the genome is transcribing a gene, telling a gene to turn on and make protein. And that we're seeing in green here, this is mini collagen mRNA. Does anyone know what that technique is where you can label mRNAs? You label mRNAs in situ in the tissue. It's called in situ hybridization. Anyone heard of that? No. Okay, great. We did learn something today. All right. Um, okay. And so the other the things that you see in red are where we used an antibody to detect where a protein is. And so here you're seeing mini collagen, two ways of detecting mini collagen that show us early and late stage developing stinging cells. And so if we look a little bit later in embryos, you can zoom in on one of these cells and you can see really nicely, the green is showing you RNA, the red is showing you where the early capsule is developing. So that is the structure that's gonna fill up, once it's mature, it's gonna fill up with pressure and the harpoon is gonna be inside there. So we can actually detect it before it's fully mature. And this is really nice. It's a really robust marker for where stinging cells are developing. So we can look anytime in the lifetime of these animals and find new stinging cells that are being made because they're constantly using these cells to feed themselves, to anchor in their environment and to protect themselves. So they're constantly, uh, these cells are dying and they're constantly being remade from a population of stem cells. So here you can see new cells being made in the tentacle tips um, and also in the body wall of these animals. As I mentioned, they're burrowing animals, so they're firing these cells into the environment as they burrow. Okay, so this is where mini collagen develops. This is where we see mini collagen. So anytime a cell turns on mini collagen, it knows it's gonna be a stinging cell. So if we wanna know where stinging cells came from and how they get turned on in the first place, what we need to look for is genes that control the expression of mini collagen. So genes that are upstream of this one that are turning this one on. And so the way that works is this. If you look in the genome, this is kind of a cartoon diagram of what a gene looks like. And so each gene has kind of two broad section, sections of it. They have coding sequence, which is the part that actually translates into protein. And then there's non-coding sequence, which is the part where regulatory genes combine, regulatory proteins combine. And so what we are looking for when we're looking for genes that can turn on mini collagen is transcription factors, right? Transcription factors are genes that encode proteins, little 
to many layers deep here that can bind to the regulatory region upstream of other genes and either activate or repress the expression of those genes. So transcription factors are really important for directing cell identity because they turn on all the other genes that make cell types. Does that make sense? Okay, great. All right, so I'm gonna tell you only about one other gene in this whole talk, I promise, and that is this one. This is a gene called NVSOX2. Um, it is a transcription factor and it was really exciting to us because it has a very similar expression pattern to mini collagen, right? If you look throughout development, we saw mini collagen is expressed kind of in these scattered cells throughout the ectoderm. And so is NVSOX2. So this is just a slightly different technique for staining, but you can see it's scattered in these individual cells throughout the ectoderm. It becomes concentrated in the tentacle tips. But one thing is really exciting about NVSOX2, and that is that it's expressed earlier than mini collagen. So mini collagen doesn't turn on until the gastrulus stage, but NVSOX2 is expressed at the blastulus stage. And so this led us to the hypothesis that maybe NVSOX2 is controlling the expression of mini collagen. And thus is required for stinging cell development. And so we developed this hypothesis that if SOX2, NVSOX2 is required for the development of stinging cells, and if we knock out SOX2, we should lose mini collagen expression in stinging cells. And so that's what we did. And we did that using everybody's favorite new uh, technology, CRISPR-Cas9. Who's heard of CRISPR-Cas9? Everybody has, okay, good. Yep, we won't learn anything in this part. All right, who wants to explain how it works? Aha, all right, still gonna learn something. <laughs> okay, in a very brief sense, in a very broad sense, this is how CRISPR-Cas9 works. So there are two components to the system. One is called the guide RNA, um, which recognizes and binds to a region of DNA that you want to cut out of the genome. And then there's Cas9, which is an enzyme that actually cuts the DNA. And so you can see that in, that di in this diagram here, the guide RNA is this kind of loopy full structure that's complementary to the DNA. And the Cas9 is this kind of blobby blob structure uh, that comes in and actually does the cutting of the DNA. All right, and so this is, the locus, this is the SOX2 gene in the Matastella. And so what we did was design guide RNAs to two different sites. We designed one upstream in the regulatory region, and we designed one downstream right before the stop codon, right before the end of this gene. And what we were hoping is that if, we, uh, if those two guide RNAs actually cut the genome, then we would lose the start site here. So we would not get transcription. In fact, we would just knock out this complete gene. And so the way that we introduce CRISPR reagents into our animal is to inject uh, guide RNAs and Cas9 together with a fluorescent dye into the fertilized egg before it starts dividing. And so that looks like this. Um, here on the bottom right, you can see a fluorescent microscope. This is a dissecting microscope. And on the stage there is this little dish of embryos. They're not really embryos, they're zygotes, they're fertilized eggs, they haven't started cleaving yet. So if we inject into the egg, once the egg starts dividing, all of the mutations that we generate in the egg should be inherited by all the cells that divide from that egg. Okay, so did it work? It did. Otherwise I wouldn't be telling you this story, right? Yes, okay. Uh, all right, so here you see on the top a wild type uh, abbreviated developmental series going from the blastula stage to the late larva. You can see wild type expression of NVSOX2 up there. So scattered cells all throughout the ectoderm. And just below that, you can see the same developmental stages in a mutant animal. So this is an animal we injected with a CRISPR-Cas9. We cut out that gene, it couldn't be transcribed, and so we couldn't detect the RNA. So you see nothing in those images at the bottom. So this is great. So then the question is, do these animals have stinging cells? And this is where the story takes a little bit of a weird turn. Um, they do indeed have stinging cells, but there's more to the story than that. Um, okay, so here on the left, you're seeing uh, an image. It's just a white light image. It's called differential interference contrast microscopy. So you can see kind of a 3D structure of unlabeled tissue. Um, this is from the body wall region of this animal. And so what you can see at the tips of these blue arrows is lots of beautiful little stinging cells. They look like little grains of rice kind of scattered throughout the uh, body wall of this animal. Um, so these are small piercing cells. These are nematocytes, and those are the cells that are normally there in the wild type polyp. If we zoom in on one of those, you can see really clearly this little harpoon structure looks kind of like a little pencil stuck down in the, inside the capsule. 
Okay, and so here's what we saw in the mutants. We did not lose stinging cells. We just got this super weird cell type that developed. So instead of having a harpoon, it has no harpoon. And it has this, that's maybe obvious <laughs> instead of having a harpoon, uh, it has this super tightly coiled, uh, really thick spiral thread inside it, spiral tubule inside of it. So this was super weird. We didn't really know what to make of this at first. And so we wanted to take a deeper look. And so we used a different type of microscopy. This is called scanning electron microscopy. And what we're looking at here is uh, in the last slide, I was showing you unfired cells that are scattered throughout the body wall. In these images, I'm showing you individual fired stinging cells. So we've now forced the harpoon to come out. And so now we can look at the structure of the harpoon in these cells. So on the left, again, you're seeing a wild type cell. Um, capsule is at the bottom, it's false colored yellow. And then you can see that beautiful harpoon, that spiny region extending away from the capsule. And on the right, you can see the mutant cell, which looks completely different, right? The capsule is kind of flimsy, it's kind of deflated on itself, and there's no harpoon whatsoever. There's just this smooth, unadorned tubule extending away from it. And so what this means to us is that knockout of this gene, NVSOX2, seems to abolish harpoon development. It made these cells, it didn't kill the cells, it didn't prevent them from being developed. They just developed with no harpoon. And this is really exciting because across cnidarians, I told you there's three or so different types of stinging cells, piercing cells, and then these other two types, spirocytes and ticocytes, are ensnaring and adherent cells. So these other two cell types naturally lack a harpoon. And so this is what they look like. These cells are really weird to look at. So I'll talk you through what you're looking at. This is the apex of the cell. This is a fired cell. So this is the apex of it. And this is the tubule that's extending away. You can already see it has a really weird morphology. It has this kind of accordion folded tubule here. This cell uh, packs its tubule into the car um, capsule in this weird kind of haphazard way. And it's really unusual. It's found only in tube anemones. So tube anemones are a small group of cnidarians. There's only about 200 species in the whole group. And they make and live in a tube that they make out of fired stinging cells. So these stinging cells have no harpoon. They have no venom. These animals have these cells in their body wall. You've seen these animals there in the lab. They fire these little harpoon-free stinging cells into the sediment. They draw in these little bits of sediment to make this tube, and that's what they live in. So that's what this cell type is for. The other cell type that naturally lacks a harpoon is called spirocytes. These are incredibly common. They are found in all the corals, all the sea anemones, all of their relatives, which compose about half of all cnidarians. So this is a really common cell type. And hopefully you can see here the apex of the cell um, and this unadorned tubule extending away, which looks very much like our mutant cell. And look at this. This is what a spirocyte looks like in DIC, these super tightly packed coils, right? And so you can see where I'm going with this. I think what we found, we showed it by studying development in these animals, that knockout of NVSOX2 seemed to transform a piercing cell into a non-piercing cell. And so I think that tells us something about the evolution of these cell types. And that is, they think a spirocyte was the ancestral cell type and that we expressed NVSOX2 on top of that cell, inside that cell, to get the evolution of a nematocyte, a cell that had a piercing structure, a harpoon. Or harpoonically, um, if that's a word. Uh, you know, we have this kind of unadorned uh, cell type there first, and we added this gene to it and all of the downstream genes that NVSOX2 controls. And that's how we got the evolution of this kind of spiny basal uh, harpoon structure. So I think this is really exciting. This is just sort of the beginning of this story. We have a lot of work to do to figure out what NVSOX2 is controlling, but I think this is giving us some kind of clue about where the diversity of these cell types comes from. Okay, and so where are we going with this? I'm gonna ask you to go on a little mental journey with me. I think the big take home from this is that stinging cell evolution is modular. And what I mean by that is this, if you can imagine a time when stinging cells were first evolving from whatever ancestral cell type they arose from, you might imagine that one of the first features that they had to have was this capsule, this pressurized structure inside the cell that could forcefully eject some kind of contents. So here we go. This is the first step, hopefully. Sometime thereafter, the tubule that it ejects could involve some kind of adornment, something like spines along the length of the tubule. 
Sometime thereafter, maybe those spines became regionalized such that you got these long spines at the base of the versible tubule, and that's what gave rise to the harpoon. Sometime thereafter, maybe you have even further elaboration of this, so you start to get that kind of dart structure that we saw at the very beginning of the talk, these really rigid spines and really toxic venom. And so I think what I showed you today is that we found one gene that controlled just one aspect of this morphological evolution, right? Just the basal regionalization of those spines. So you get those long spines at the base of that eversible tubule. And if that's true, if there's one gene that controls the development of the harpoon, maybe there's one gene that controls all of these other traits too, right? Maybe there's one gene that controls the ability to make this capsule. Maybe there's one gene that controls the ability to put spines all along your tubule. Maybe there's one gene that controls this operculum structure, the dart structure, the toxicity of the venom. And then maybe if we just mix and match these genes, we can make whatever cell type we want. We can make a stinging cell type that never evolves naturally. And so that puts us in the position to ask this question, what cell type can't evolve? What is not possible to evolve? And this, this is literally what keeps me awake at night. I'm so excited to work on this and make kind of Franken cells. I don't know, I think this will be fun. But you can imagine this is actually really valuable aside from just the, the pure joy of tinkering with cells. Um, it's not hard to imagine that a tiny cell that ejects a little hypodermic needle could actually be quite valuable for medical applications, um, nanotechnologies, all kinds of sorts of things. And so, um, it's not just a, a brain curiosity thing. I think there's actually value in this type of research. Okay, so where do we go from here? Um, we're interested in trying to make a truly new type of stinging cell. We've been working largely on this animal in my lab, this burrowing sea anemone that I introduced you to. Um, but we also have two other species of cnidarians in the lab that we like to work with. So the northern star coral that I introduced you to previously, and then one species of tube anemone we also have in the lab. And so what we're trying to do is first characterize the different types of stinging cells that are found in these different animals, and then develop some technologies for finding out when and where these cells develop and what genes are involved. And so what you can see here is uh, we can actually use CRISPR instead, to, instead of cutting out a gene, we can use it to knock in a gene. And so here we're driving the expression of a green fluorescent protein using a transcription factor that turns on mini collagen. And so we can show that we get green fluorescent protein anywhere new stinging cells are developing in this coral. <clears throat> and so then the goal is to mix and match these genes. Maybe we can take a transcription factor out of the coral and use it to drive a stinging cell gene in nematostella. And we can see what happens when these two genes that are not supposed to go together come together in the right cell type how does that change the morphology of this cell? I think that gives us a lot of power to kind of understand how these cell types emerged and how they diversified in the first place. So this is where we're going with it. And this is what I'm really excited about. Okay, and so this is my lab. Uh, I started my lab two and a half years ago at Cornell. We are really broadly interested in novelty where novel traits come from. Stinging cells are just one of those traits. Um, it turns out tenophores also have some really cool novel cell types, so we also like to work on those. Um, and although I am a marine biologist, I'm really an indoor scientist, so we do a lot of lab work, which you can see here. Uh, but if you're interested in what we do, uh, you should reach out to me and let me know. I'm happy to talk about what we do. If you happen to be at Cornell, we are always looking for um, new people to work with us. So that is the end of the science part of the talk, and I thought what I would do is just spend a couple of minutes talking about how I got here, unless we need to call it quits. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk for, for those of you who are considering science as a career or graduate school, I wanted to talk a little bit about how I got here, how I became a scientist, because it's a little bit of an unusual winding path. Um, so I'm going to talk about kind of grad school to my new professor position. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to back up a little bit and tell you, as Jen mentioned, I went to undergrad at the University of Miami. And I went there because I knew I wanted to be a marine scientist. And they have a truly amazing marine school, the Rasmus uh, School for Marine and Atmospheric Science. Um, what I didn't really realize at the time is that you're supposed to be an adult in undergrad and like, you know, take your career seriously. And so many of you are doing research already, and I didn't. I did no research as an undergrad. Um, I just didn't really have it together. And so when I first applied to grad school, I didn't get in anywhere. Um, and that ended up being a really good path for me 
because what it meant is that I took a gap year um, and I worked at a, a national park in South Florida. So this is Biscayne National Park. It's an incredibly beautiful place to work. Um, and I spent a lot of time there uh, doing conservation biology and interacting with a lot of coastal marine organisms like the sea turtle you see here. And during that time, I realized this park is, is located here. It's just south of Miami. And it's right on the coast here in Biscayne Bay. And what's happening in South Florida is the coastal areas are becoming hypersaline, like very, very, very salty, because there's a lot of agriculture in the south and they're diverting fresh water. So it stays on land and it's not going off into the coast anymore. And so I became really interested in how some animals were able to tolerate really high salt in their environment. And that motivated my choice to go to graduate school and to try to study the origins of marine habitat use in reptiles. And so you might recognize these are not invertebrates, they're not cnidarians. I was working on a completely different group of animals before. Um, and what I was really interested in was kind of physiological ecology. Like how do these animals tolerate salt in their environment? And so I went to graduate school. I got to do a lot of field work in Taiwan, which is where I collected these animals. These are sea snakes. They are the coolest snakes ever. Um, they live in the ocean, as their name suggests, they eat fish, they take in a lot of salt while they're eating, and so they have to excrete that salt to keep their body fluids low. And so I did a whole project trying to figure out how they handle salt. And it turns out, like other marine reptiles, sea snakes have this salt secreting gland. It's found in um, under their tongue over here. Uh, birds also have a salt secreting gland kind of up in the orbit of their eye. Marine iguanas have one near their nasal uh, orbits, nasal opening. Sea turtles have it right in front of their eye and crocodilians have it in the soft tissue of their tongue. And so it turns out if you look into this gland at the cell and tissue level, you don't have to think about data right now, we're at the end of the talk. Um, but the point is, if you look at the cells that are there, it's the same cell type in all of these glands that evolved independently in each of these lineages of animals. Each of these lineages invaded the marine habitat independently. They all developed the same gland that works the same way independently. And it turns out this same cell type, which works to secrete concentrated sodium chloride, is exactly the same cell type that enables you to secrete concentrated salt in your urine. So it's in your kidneys, just like uh, marine mammals have this too. It's also the same cell type that's in the gills of teleos fish. And it's also the same cell type that's in the rectal salt secreting gland of elasmobranchs. And so the summary of my dissertation uh, led me to this question, which was how does the same cell type keep evolving multiple times? And when I really pondered this, I realized this is exactly the opposite of what I'm interested in, right? I'm not interested to know how the same thing evolves over and over again. I wanted to know how new cell types ever evolve. And so that's what motivated my choice to start my postdoc. Um, I originally started my postdoc at Kiwalo Marine Lab, which is in Honolulu, so in the south side of Oahu, which is where I met this animal. And I first met stinging cells. So you can see some of the stinging cells being fired with that laser that I talked to you about. I was there for a couple of years and then my postdoc advisor got recruited to be the director of the Whitney Marine Lab at the University of Florida. So I moved with him. We moved here to the coast of Florida here to this, another astoundingly beautiful marine lab, um, which is where I met my other favorite animal, tenophores. And I really started thinking about the evolution of cell type identity and are there kind of common principles that we can derive by studying novel cell types in all of these different animals. And that led me to where I am now and to my lab now, which is stuff that I talked about a lot today. So I won't belabor that point. I'll end with one other point, which is, um, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I've had a long relationship with marine labs. I am currently an instructor at yet another marine lab. I teach in the embryology course at the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole, um, which is on the Cape in Massachusetts, not that far from here. And last summer, I started a field research project with my very first PhD student. This is Yureli Alvarez. You can see her on the right. She's collecting fighting sea anemones. Um, and we did that at Friday Harbor, which is also a marine lab. And so I'll end where I began, which is just that I want to thank all of you so much for being here and for letting me be here, because marine labs have been a huge part of my journey. And I hope that they are as special for you as they were for me. So with that, I'll stop talking. Oh, <laughs>
All right. If you have questions, we'll entertain that for a few minutes. Uh, if you have questions online, use the Q and A. And if you have a question in the room, raise your hand, and I will come over with this here microphone. Put it right up to your mouth. Hi. Um, so you talked about your journey. Um, I was wondering what is one tip that you would give to aspiring marine biologists or people that won't work in the lab to get to the point where you're at right now? Good question. I think the single most important thing you can do, do not rush to graduate school. I would say I'll say this to any of you. Take time. Think about what you want to do. Graduate school may or may not be the right thing for you. There's lots of ways to do research, even if you choose not to go to graduate school. And you should do research. It's fun. It's rewarding. It's amazing. But it may turn out that grad school is not right for you, and that's totally okay. It may turn out that the thing you think you want to do, you think you want to work on physiological ecology of sea snakes, turns out to be something you're interested in for a very narrow window of your life. And then you want to work on something completely different. And that's also totally okay. So do as many different types of research experiences as you can before you commit to graduate school. Um, and then uh, go for it. Yeah. Who else? Right up to your mouth. <laughs> okay, first, thank you for a super talk. It's made me a little more afraid of stinging cells, but thank you nonetheless. I'm wondering um, if you have any knowledge or speculation about, you know, sort of where the NV SOX2 gene comes from. Yes. Are these other genes going to be part of a family? Has it been duplicated? Uh, let me know what you think about that. Yes. Uh, if you want to know a complicated answer to that, this paper just came out a couple of months ago, actually, and we have a phylogeny in there where we show where it came from. The short answer is it arose by gene duplication. So SOX genes are a really broad, common group of genes. In fact, maybe you've heard of SOX2 before. It's a really famous uh, stem cell gene. Unfortunately, the way these genes were named was not great. This gene has very little relationship to mammalian SOX2, which is the stem cell gene. Um, but it is actually a duplicate of, uh, there were probably in the ancestor of all animals, there were probably something like seven SOX genes or so, and they've du duplicated and diversified differently in each, lineages of, in each lineage of animals. It turns out this one, NV SOX2, is found only in corals and sea anemones, which are the groups, the only groups that have spirocytes. And so we think that NV SOX2 is co-opting a spirocyte to make a nematocyte, and so this gene is found only in the animals that have spirocytes, which is pretty cool. Yes. You want more than that? I could go on. Okay. okay. <laughs> I love gene duplication. I, could go I have, a, since I have the mic, I have a comment that maybe you could comment on because when you were first describing the really complicated scene, so with like the little arrow and then how it puts its venom in a tube, I was like, what the heck? Why is it putting its venom in a tube, why wouldn't it like explode on the end of the, and then your evolutionary uh, description, I was like, oh, that maybe is what, I mean, that was cool. It's cool. I think also um, these cells are by some uh, estimations, the fastest accelerating structures in biology period, right? The slowest, one of the slowest things that happens in biology is secretion, right? So if you secrete enzymes, it's painfully slow. But so why would you, how do you couple the fastest process ever with the slowest process ever? I think one of the things that they did was by putting the venom inside the tubule, they can keep it concentrated and get it into their prey super fast. If they have to secrete it, if it just comes outside of the cell, then the venom leaks into the space between the tip of your tentacle and the shrimp that you want to eat, and it can get washed away really quickly. So I think by encapsulating it in that tubule, it delivers it really fast, but it also keeps it right where you want it. Mm -hmm. I think over here. So you said it's on, that, that NVSOX4 is only found in spirocytes, and it so they kind of create their own nematocyte. So are there are the nematocytes in like jellyfish? Are the, is that sort of convergent evolution there? Okay, that's cool. Question. Yeah. Uh, we think that nematocytes are actually, nematocytes are found in all cnidarians, every species of cnidarian that has ever evolved. And the parasitic ones that I talked about have what we think is a really weird derived form of nematocyte. It doesn't have a harpoon anymore, but it has some other structures that make us think it came from that one. Right, and so if all cnidarians have nematocytes, that was probably one of the first cnidocyte types to specialize and to evolve, right? 
but only corals and sea anemones have a spirocyte. So we think a really weird thing happened where a nematocyte gave rise to a spirocyte. And in corals and sea anemones, the spirocyte then turned around and gave rise to a nematocyte. So we do think it's convergent evolution. Yeah, that they're evolving this nematocyte morphology, this, this piercing morphology in lots of different ways from lots of different ancestral cell types. Yes, that's a great question. So yeah, the, the barbs scare me in a whole new way. Yeah. But, but the venom is even more frightening. So what about the diversity of the venoms across yeah. all these types? Yeah. And is it correlated? Um, that's a good question. Are you, okay, the short answer is I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, I think there's two problems with that. One, venoms evolve really rapidly, and we know very little. There's like four species of cnidarians that we actually know anything about their venom in the first place. Um, and so I think there's one of the problems is there's just a lot of no data. There's there's not a lot of data is the right way to say that. Um, so, th so we just don't know a lot, but uh, I think it does seem that the most toxic species are in the Medusa zoa. So they're in the clade with the jellyfish, the box jellyfish. Some of the hydroids can be quite toxic. Man of wars are hydroids. Um, it seems like the anthozoans are not that toxic. The corals and sea anemones. I put nematostella on my soft, delicate skin before, and it's been fine. My animal, this, this burrowing sea anemone. I don't know. Do you want to go out there and touch a bunch of corals and sea anemones? I don't really know. Yeah, I mean, some of them, some of the sea anemones, if you touch them, it feels like Velcro, right? And I suspect that, I mean, it could be just the actual uh, harpoon touching you, but I suspect there's an enzymatic component of that too. So I don't know the answer. We don't really know that much about venom, but across animals, venom has evolved lots of different times and it's evolved to be very different. So it wouldn't surprise me if it's been gained and lost in nidocytes too, in nidarians too. Okay, you, I, think, I think you've partially answered my question okay. already. You have put the fear of God into all the vertebrates <laughs> here about the creatures you study. <laughs> there are fishes which are obligatorily commensal with sea anemones. Yes. How do they avoid a melancholy fate? Yes, that's a good question, right? The anemone fish or the clownfish are the most famous of these, right? And I think the idea is that they secrete a pretty thick mucus that sort of protects them from this. So they're not actually deflecting. What happens when these cells fire is they have a little trigger that sticks out the end of them. And when you deflect the trigger, that's what causes the apex of them to pop open and the harpoon to be released. And so the, the dogma is that these fish secrete this really nasty, this thick mucus that kind of protects them and it doesn't actually deflect the trigger on the stinging cell. I think that's all, you know, hand wavy. I think we think that that makes sense, but I don't know that anyone's actually tested that very well. Fish people in the room who know more than me should feel free to chime in, but, but I think that's what we assume to be true. Yeah, it's possible that they're immune, but I, I would doubt that. Well, with that cliffhanger of <laughs> future <you> work, <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, for thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So next up, uh, next week at this time, uh, Dr. Peter Buston from the universe uh, from Boston University is going to be here. Whoa, shout out already. I love it. Uh, his work largely fo focuses on behavior and evolution and population biology in fish. So, oh, wait, I thought we were going to ask him about the stinging cells. Um, he asks questions in his lab, like, why do some individuals forego their own reproduction and behave in cooperative societies? That's a that's a good one. And what is the probability of larval exchange or con connectivity between populations in marine metapopulations? So that is next Tuesday. And um, don't forget, all of this is on ShoalsMarineLaboratory.org. When you leave this place, you could still join us on these talks and all of them are recorded there. So thank you all so much for your attention and for your talk. Fabulous.